first wave of free agency is over. What are the Chiefs' biggest needs in the draft? Let's talk about them. This is KC Sports Network, proudly presented by M Prize Bank. Welcome into a live edition of the KC Laboratory, presented by M Prize Bank, our wonderful partners in Possible here at KCSA. And they've been day one with us. They are the official bank of the KCSN draft guide. They've been absolutely wonderful to work with. And I am here with both of my beautiful, handsome, talented friends. Matty Lane, Craig Stout, Matthew, shark shirt? You got a shark shirt on today? Is that what we're doing? Oh, Hark. <laughs> hark learn, learn your Tar Heels, buddy. Learn Why? your Tar Heels, buddy. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm doing great. I am happy that Craig is back and safe and sound with us. You know, Kent didn't give us an update at the beginning of the last podcast on Thank his you. status. So Thank I had you. to ask for it. I had to request it personally, and as did the chat. So, Craig, I, I'm glad you made it safe and sound back. You are here with us, buddy, and I, I couldn't be more excited that you're here. No, Kent just knew the honest answer, which was that I wasn't okay. I just wasn't at all okay. It wasn't anything wrong with me. I just wasn't okay. So, no, I no, I was busy uh, flashing forward to the future to read Arif's article this morning and just... <laughs> Goodness. sitting in shock and awe about the draft network bombshell that occurred this morning so uh yeah that that's where i was on monday night so i apologize for missing that one i i read that whole thing this morning and all i could say is i appreciate bj kissel more than i have ever appreciated <laughs> bj kissel my goodness i don't know how you screw up the kind of talent that the draft network had but Someone did, and you can read about that. Arif's, Arif's work was tremendous. So some of the, go I read mean, it. I know it's behind a paywall. It's worth every penny. Like if you, it, it's a phenomenal article. If you're a draft nerd at all, then you know what the draft network is, and you can. You, if you've wondered why the draft network doesn't really exist anymore, you'll find out very quickly. Uh, if, even if you're not a draft nerd or fan, please go read the article because it I is. Showed it to my it's wife. a wild ride. It's who a does wild not ride. care about the draft. She was enthralled. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> well, if your wife doesn't care about the draft, she's probably not going to like this show this week. Uh, so, one thing we kind of wanted to do is... like, no, we're she'll think it's great still. Don't tune on anybody. It's still a great show, whether you care about the draft or not. I promise. <laughs> we're removed a week from free agency, right? And we didn't want to talk about Legere Sneed again. But we thought it might be it might be time to kind of maybe pull ourselves a little bit away from... You know, from the free agent conversation, free agency conversations, just look a little bit at the draft and kind of try to set some expectations for ourselves, set some expectations. And I think it's actually a good discourse for all of us to just kind of talking about some of the positions on the offensive side of the ball that we think the Chiefs could address. We think the Chiefs could have available to them in various rounds, you know, so the day ones, the day twos, the day threes, kind of take a look at like, who could be available, who we think will be available. So that's kind of what we're going to do today. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm excited to do it. I'm excited to start with the wide receivers. I think it's a very high uh, position of need for the Chiefs, obviously, still. I think that they still need to look to address it. <clears throat> so I'll ask you, Maddie, you know, who do you think has gone by round one? Who do you think at the receiver position is a bona fide lock to be gone before the Chiefs pick at 32? Yeah, I think at this point we can go ahead and chalk up the Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze, and Malik Neighbors to off the board. Um, I think we can probably put Brian Thomas Jr. And potentially, I'm feeling pretty good on this one, Xavier Worthy probably being off the board when the Chiefs pick. Man. If those two guys might be in trade-up range, though, right? Those two guys yeah. might be in a range where you can trade up. But I think those, I think you're looking at Harrison Odunze, Neighbors, Brian Thomas Jr., and a good chance that Xavier Worthy are off the board by pick 32. Do you guys have like much pushback on either one of those guys being out or like all those guys still being available? No, no, definitely not, especially after Xavier Worthy's pro day today. Um, I Mike McDaniel is enamored with that man. Uh, and it makes all the sense of the world. Like, as soon as you see him sitting there smiling at Xavier Worthy, you know, shaking his hand and all that, like, man. They're going to add another elite fast guy to that offense, and it's going to be a real pain in the ass to defend. But, um, yeah, no, I think 
that clearly all of those guys are going to be gone before pick 32. Yes. I think before, before the NFL combine, the chiefs had a chance at Xavier worthy at 32. I am not as convinced that the chiefs realistically yeah. have a chance at Xavier worthy at 32. And it, it and Brian Thomas too. Like I, I think Brian Thomas, like I think there's a chance that he goes earlier than people think. And I think if he doesn't, there's a chance the Chiefs trade up for him. I could see both Brian Thomas and Xavier Worthy being considered as trade up candidates for this team if they fall into a reasonable range for the Chiefs to try to go up and get them. I wouldn't be surprised by either of those. And part of it's because they both have a vertical stretch of ability that I think this team probably covets. And, you know, there's so many really good names in this draft at the receiver position. But when you're looking at it, you've kind of also got to ask yourself fit for the Chiefs. We didn't bring Adonai Mitchell's name up here. You know, just, you know, as we were talking about locks for the first round, some, he's getting some sizzle today. I saw a report uh, from Jordan Schultz talking about how they think, you know, there's some belief that he's around one lock too. I don't know if I'm all the way there. But I'm not going to be surprised in the slightest if he is a first round pick before the Chiefs are ultimately selecting. But I'm not sure Adonai Mitchell's a elite fit for this team relative to some of these other guys, depending on if they're trying to typecast a still a skill set or if they see him fitting in in year one. Those are the kind of things that you kind of got to. The list can get small quick if you're not too careful. Yeah, no, I'm. That's that's kind of why I think we wanted to do this whole exercise is just kind of start looking at guys that will be off the board and the player pool you're you're working from. And I agree, Brian Thomas Jr. probably not likely to even be in trade up territory or like it's kind of 50 50 if he's even in like trade up territory, which would yeah. be like the early to mid 20s. Um, Xavier Worthy, I feel a little better about getting to that range, but it's still no guarantee. So then now the guys you're looking at 32, right? AD Mitchell is one, and I'm kind of with Kent there. I don't know if I love the fit in KC, but I think some people do. And so like you can see a way that works. Keon Coleman still has some fans. Same thing though. Like I don't know if he's a Chiefs type of wide receiver with the lack of speed and everything that he has, but he's another guy that will be available. And then I think the last guy that I think you get a lot of buzz for the end of the round one that I think this is where a lot of Chiefs fans lead, Lad McConkey, mm -hmm. 7-11, right there at 32. Let's it's go. easy to see how he slots into this offense, especially if Hollywood Brown moves on after one season. But like, I think that's kind of the wide receiver pool you're probably selecting from at 32, and it's not that deep. And to Kent's point, this is all contingent on the Chiefs saying all three of these players not only fit our team, but fit our culture and what we want in the locker room. And that we just won't know. Like that's not a that's not a huge pool, I think, that you're really looking at there at 32. I mean, maybe a guy like Troy Franklin is a possibility, but at this point, that almost feels like you're reaching just a tiny bit based on what everyone else thinks. So the pool of wide receivers available at 32 might not be as big as we once kind of thought it was going to be. Especially if the Chiefs are targeting an X. Like, I mean, that's the other part of the Hollywood Brown addition here. And I get that he's on a one-year deal. It doesn't preclude you from taking another guy that's maybe a smaller speedster, you know, that sort of deal. But the role that they don't have right now, because Rasheed Rice can flex around a little bit. He plays a number of different positions. He's good out of the slot. He's good out wide. You've got a guy in Hollywood that can operate out of the slot, can operate as a Z a little bit. You know, you can protect him a little bit more. They don't have that true X. And you look at a guy like Lab McConkey, I don't know that he fits the X. Like, I don't know that he fits that sort of role for him. So, you know, a Keon Coleman maybe comes into the picture a little bit more because he's a bigger body. If he hits, now all of a sudden you feel good about where you are in your X wide receiver position. It's added more questions than answers here. Brian Thomas Jr., I think, is the only realistic guy that really fits the Chiefs mold from both a size perspective, the ability to play that X receiver perspective and the speed perspective that we've seen that they have coveted as of late. He kind of checks a lot of boxes for them. So I think after he goes, now I've got more questions about how these guys fit, where they'll be able to contribute in year one. Keon Coleman needs a lot of work, but you know, it, I get how that can happen. Same with Adonai Mitchell. I, you can get there with those guys. The, the the ceiling is high, but the floor is also a little bit lower than you would want from a guy at 32 to fit into this offense. So I just have a lot more questions about where they fit with the other guys in the offense here at 32 based on those remaining options that we just listed there.
Let's move and fast forward to day two of the draft, and you're sitting at round or at pick 64. <clears throat> I think things get a little bit more interesting here because I think there's a really strong pocket, and a few of these players will probably be available. I think we can probably say the Adonai Mitchell's gone, Xavier Worthy's gone, Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey are all gone by pick 64. But then, like, you Troy could Franklin make too. Troy well, Franklin too. Maybe I have, actually see. I'm a little. I'm a little bit more down on this area of the draft than Kent is because I think if you look at other strong wide receiver classes, you pretty consistently get 13 wide receivers off the board before pick 64. So once you do that, you're down to looking at, I mean, like I'm just using the consensus board right now for wide receivers. So there's obviously a little give or take, right? But you're looking at Jalen Polk, Tez Walker, Brendan Rice as your top guys left. I don't feel, I feel like that's a pretty significant step down. Now, some of the names I'm skipping over that I think are being contention, but you don't know how it's going to go. Xavier Leggett, Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, Malachi Corley, like typically 13-ish, 10, 12, 13 wide receivers in a good wide receiver class are going before you pick at 64. So I am a little afraid that if the Chiefs sit around and wait, you're going to be drafting at the back end of this group again and being left with you know, the leftovers. And the last time the Chiefs did that in 2022, I'm not saying it's the reason he messed up, but Sky Moore was the 13th well, wide receiver <laughs> taken in that draft. And I just I just want to say, like, you don't want to be at the end of that. And if you can go back to 2020 draft as well, the last wide receiver taken in that was Denzel Mims. Do you want to be the guy taking the last one of a group? I don't know. So that's why I'm a little worried about 64 as a wide receiver. On top of that, they traded back to be the to make the 13th pick at the receiver yeah. position. That's and I think as we're having these talks, like I think you listed a lot of the players that I think make sense. The you know the Jalen Polks, the Malachi Corley, Xavier Leggett, Tez Walker, Ricky Pearsall, Roman Wilson, Jalen McMillan. Those guys, those names that you're hearing there are all players that could go before 63 or 64, could not. They could also be in that trade up territory as well. Like this could be a situation where you do try to get into the middle of that kind of bucket. And I think it kind of just depends on what they want. If you want a vertical stretch guy, Troy Franklin out of Oregon is a guy that makes some sense to, to Craig's point. I don't know if Troy Franklin is as stone cold of a lock to be gone at 64. And I don't know if it's like, I think that cluster of players, you know, he didn't run four three the way some people were kind of hoping he was going mm -hmm. to. He ran more of a four, four type, uh, but it's, it's pick your poison. Cause like you, I mean, Maddie, you said Tez Walker. If you're looking for another vertical stretch guy, Tez Walker at 64, I think I can live with, with a player like that, but there's a lot of receivers that are going to fall off the board, and then you've got to figure out how to tight cast what you need, what you want within this offense, which I do think this team will still try to do. There's going to be a theme to the players that they mo like they covet more than just a shotgun approach of we're going to just take the best receiver available. I think there will be some preferences there for them as they're kind of working through some of this. Sorry, I was letting Craig get in there, but I, yeah, uh, no, 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 I agree. no, I don't know. I fully agree. There is a chance that you can have a player that I think you're very comfortable with as a Chiefs fan at 64. So if you don't want to force a wide receiver in round one, we told you the guys that we think, you know, A.D. Mitchell, Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey. say even your favorite one of those guys goes off the board before they pick in round one, you don't like the other two, and you just want to wait and go till 64. I think the strategy is kind of fine, but then I think you really do run the risk of being taking the last person to the ball, right? You're the last person to get to ask somebody to the ball. And yeah. I think there's a chance when I run mock draft simulators, you know, like we all do more often than not, I am left taking a Tez Walker or a Jermaine Burton, or, I mean, I do have a little bit of a sleeper for Javon Baker out of UCF that I've kind of, well, I think we'll talk about him in this next group too, that I do feel pretty good about there. But the majority of the guys, I just think you take a pretty big step back and now we've hit, I'm kind of drafting a very role specific wide receiver for a team that I think is still looking for a pure starter next to Rasheed Rice in the future. So like that is just like my only hesitation about saying, oh, don't worry about wide receiver in round one. It's a good class. Like, yeah, it is. But there's definitely, I think, a chance that you miss out big time on those guys that are true starting level wide receivers if you wait till 64. Yeah. And especially I've always, you know, throughout this offseason, it's been, hey, if they sign Hollywood Brown, pair him with Jalen Polk. I, I love that pairing. I think that the two complement each other very well. Hollywood Brown's on a one-year deal, though. Like, that was always the assumption. It's like, oh, hey, yeah, he's going to stick around for a little while with Rasheed Rice. Like, those three guys make so much sense together. 
Now, all of a sudden, if you take Hollywood Brown out of the equation in 2025, which that's not to say that the Chiefs aren't you know, going to sign him long term, but as it stands right now, you take him out of the equation. I don't love Rasheed Rice and Jalen Polk as your two primary options there. I'm trying to shoot a little bit higher. I'm I'm more amenable to a Malachi Corley who just has terrific hands, a little bit more flexibility, you know, was going to run through guys very much, you know, a guy that Andy Reid's going to give the ball to a lot in a lot of situations and have him, you know, create yak and things like that. But he's got a lot of progress as a wide receiver that he still <laughs> needs to make. He's got a lot of Rishi Rice in him. Correct. He does. He does. But I can see how those two can coexist a little bit more. They play a little bit different styles. They get the ball in a little bit different ways. I can see how DBs would not enjoy playing against Malachi Corley and Rasheed Rice on the same team. So I see ways to make that happen a little bit more while still having a guy that has the ability to stretch a little over the top there that you're not locked into just one singular thing. But I, again, I look at this, a Ricky Pearsall would be nice, tested out mm -hmm. of the gym, obviously, would be really nice. And I wouldn't mind that. Like, if that's the pick here, there is a little bit of same here, but I'm less concerned about that at pick 64 than I was at pick 32, where you're just trying to find a guy that slots in a little bit better. Talk a little bit about round three. You know, there's going to be some names out there that probably go between round two and three. And again, so like you might have to trade up for one of these guys, but a, you know, a Javon Baker. A Jermaine Burton, but Jermaine Burton, he's talented. There's just some off field stuff too. You might see a Malik Washington gone before pick 95, and it is 95, I believe. Uh, Brendan Rice, uh, another guy that could potentially be off the board by then. Like, I think that this is where the tiers really fall off. And I don't know how many picks in that round three range. Like, I think, I think the pool of round three ish type receivers is actually pretty small for me. And like, that's about what it is for me. Add Jalen McMillan, uh, the other Washington receiver mm -hmm. there to it too. Oh, yeah. I'm with you. I, I I'm actually with you. I think there's a chance he's gone by pick 64. Sure. I, I love him. Yeah, but, I would agree with yeah. that. I just, so you're right though. Like talking about how this pool kind of, you think dries up a little bit here, even more. Like, I think there's a pretty big gap from like what I'm going to say is top 50. And then what's going to be there at 64. I think I'm with you. It dries up even more in round three. And historically, again, looking at like some of the better wide receiver drafts of recent years, 2022, 2020, 13 wide receivers are going before pick 64. Only both those drafts, only three more wide receivers went before pick 95. So the NFL kind of does the same thing. They're going to take the guys that they want early, but as it goes on towards the end of day two, they start to take less and less guys for the same reason. Like you start to look now, I'm like, okay, we like all those names you just made, but can we start maybe finding, we're now talking about role players. Are they definitely separating themselves from other guys later in the draft? So like, I'm with you. I do think it gets a little dicey. I I almost feel like if you get to pick 64 and you don't love the guy that's the top guy, say whatever guy, you know, falls to stereo, maybe it's not a poll. Maybe it is a Brendan Rice is the best player left. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. maybe the Chiefs don't like him, whatever it is. I'm not trying to say they do or don't like anybody, but if they don't like their best option at 64, I don't know if there's going to be a huge difference between that best player then and the best wide receiver available at 95. I think you're almost better just kind of riding that out. I would rather take the last person at 95, I think, from these groups of guys we've talked about than be the last one to take the guy at 64, if that makes any sense. I mean, and, especially, yeah, go ahead, Ken. Well, no, you go, go, Craig. It's okay. I, I was just going to say, especially if it's a guy like Malik Washington that's going to contribute. Like, I, I, I think he slots immediately into the Chiefs' office. Again, there's a little more sane there, but he's a real wide receiver. He's going to do wide receiver things in this offense immediately. He's going to come in and contribute. I I know that I'm a really an unabashed Malik Washington stan here, but... Same. He, yeah, he showed that it's not just, oh, he's really slow. He's going to get hawked every time he tries to go over the top. He's, you know, just this intermediate route runner he's got a little bit more juice he showed that at the combine now all of a sudden you see him starting to go a little bit earlier in the third round i would like that guy like if he's still around there i think that that is a slam dunk pick there's not a whole lot of other guys i know i know maddie you like javon baker i see a lot of guys that are trying to say johnny wilson you know a guy that's kind no. of like a hybrid tight end wide Let's receiver tight end. That kind of guy i mean yeah exactly like i don't I don't love his fit in Kansas City. And then after those guys, 
it's really dropping. It's guys that the Chiefs we know are, you know, have have been interested in that they've talked to and things like that. But they're more day three guys at that point. Cornelius Johnson, Ryan Flournoy, guys like that that you know are are going to be around in round four. You're going to have a shot at some of those guys. So I'm with Maddie there. I I think I'd rather gamble than try and force the picture at at 64 and hope that a Malik Washington is there at pick, you know, 95, whenever it is, I'd rather wait in that scenario because I don't think that you have to pull the trigger on that guy. I think you feel a little more comfortable in the drop off from 64 to even round four, like a Cornelius Johnson. I think you feel more comfortable in that drop off than from 32 to 64, in my opinion. There are a ton of scenarios that end with Malik Washington being the first receiver the Chiefs draft at pick 95 that I'm happy with. I'll just tell you that. Like, I think there's, you know, if you've got seven receivers falling off the board early in the first round, that means there's a good chance that there's a good player at a different position falling to the Chiefs at 32, especially yeah. if, and hey, we'll do draft tiers for quarterbacks. I think five quarterbacks go off the board in the first round. Moving on back to receivers. I think there's there's scenarios where Malik Washington being the 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 third round uh, pick and the Chiefs are able to you know snag a tackle at the end of round one and you know have you know there's a bit there's a lot of positions they took a Marshawn Neal into edge we'll talk about defensive players some somewhere down the road but like I think there's plenty of scenarios if Malik Washington was the pick at 95 I'd be thrilled we've done 22 minutes you don't need to jump in anymore Maddie. There's a draft show for this. Draft tiers moving on to the running back position. First round running backs, all of them are available. Cool. Moving on. Second Thank round. You. <laughs> They're probably all available at the second round, too. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. There's a good chance. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, it's, there's probably one. I'm going to assume that at least one, but probably one. I'm going to say one of, you know, the top running backs comes off the board before the chiefs pick in the second round. But I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, if I set that line at 1.5 running backs before 64, I'd probably still take the under. Right. And like, good luck picking who it's going to be. If Jonathan Brooks didn't have the injury, I would say him for sure. But with him being injured, it, Jalen Wright from Tennessee has got a lot of steam for being, you know, an explosive player. Trey Benson, kind of same thing. I think you're going to see one of those like explosive home run hitting running backs come off the board in round two. But I still think you're looking at literally any running back you want in round two. And I really don't think the Chiefs should take any of them unless they want Jonathan Brooks. I, I can't be too mad if they take Jonathan Brooks at 64. He's the one. He is yeah. the one. Like he, he's the one. And again, I know that people are going to say that's way too high for a running back. You can find other value later in the draft. I totally agree. You, you're yes. not going to get agree. a pushback. Jonathan Brooks changes this offense in a way that nobody else, no other running back in this draft, changes this offense once he's healthy. And the only Others? reason the Chiefs should have a, him available at 64 is because he's not healthy. So I, I, we can move off from round two unless you have more, Kent. I just want to say there is one other running back that I am enamored with. And if they took him at 64, I'd actually be really excited. But we're going to wait for the KCSN draft show for you guys to hear that one. Okay. Because I don't want to duplicate too much of this week's episode. But that is a good chance to remind you all that the KCSN draft guide is available for pre order right now. $13.99. You get the book that releases here in a couple of weeks on April 5th. It's 300 plus pages of Chiefs specific draft content, including 225 write ups on pros prospects and how they fit the Chiefs specifically. Uh, the link is in the description of the show. You also get the uh, three months of the KCSN Substack for, for th uh, three months there as well. $13.99. Link in the description. Please consider purchasing. Uh, real quick on I, day three. If there's a, is there a bunch of round three running backs you're excited about? Even with like I I don't know. Like there's there's probably going to be plenty available, but like I I don't know, man. Same thing. Like I think I think I think once you get to round three, I think what's going to happen is some teams are going to start looking around and be like, okay, the not enough running backs have come off the board. We I think this running back class isn't super strong, but there's a lot of guys in contention for running back one. So I think there's a chance that a handful of teams can draft quote unquote their running back one in the third round. So you might actually have a handful come off then because everyone thinks they're getting their top running back. So yeah, I think it, I think you could have a minute a little mini run on running backs going round three. I, I'm not gonna sit here and slam the table for the Chiefs taking a running back 
it, on you know anywhere beside anyone besides Jonathan Brooks and the first two days in the NFL draft, I don't really want to entertain too awful much. That's kind no. of where I end with that. No, not at all. Wait until day three, take Blake, Wa- Blake Watson at the end of the draft and be happy. Like that's well, that's where I am right now. I I think that's kind of the move. And, you know, I think you're going to have a lot of running backs at your disposal, at your availability, and a lot of picks. It's just a matter of when you actually want to pull the trigger on one of them. We're going to take a break. We'll be back to talk about the tight ends right after this. We appreciate you supporting KC Sports Network by listening to our podcast. You have helped us become the highest ranked Chiefs podcast network in 2022 and 2023. And don't forget about our daily Substack newsletter, the best written analysis you can find on the Chiefs straight to your inbox every day. KCSN.substack.com. And please feel free to pre-order the KCSN draft guide. Link is in the description of the show. Gentlemen, I'm going to I'm going to hit the tight end here the tight end group here but i do have like a a theory i'm throwing around that's i'm probably gonna hammer on for the next month i don't like it but okay uh brett veach traded tyree kill for a bunch of draft picks and then brett veach used some of that draft capital to go and move up for what he saw was a blue chip player on his board if the Chiefs get extra draft capital for Legereus need, I very easily could see Brett Veach doing something very similar and being ultra aggressive and going up and getting a blue chip player on his board if they Brian were to Thomas start Jr. falling. <laughs> Brian Thomas Jr., I think, is definitely one of them. I love that Craig and I are on this train now. I wasn't. I, I've been <laughs> on it. No, you weren't on it. I wasn't. I uh, Brian, Brian Thomas is good. But oh, just Brian Thomas Jr. Yeah, just him specifically. And specifically. It, I think it makes a lot of sense. That's a different show. We we did 20 some minutes on wide receivers. We can touch on him again later, but like I think that's the, like the the one trade up thing that like I'm probably willing to sacrifice a lot for for a myriad of reasons that we can talk about at a later date. There is a lot to that. And like that's oh. and not exactly the same but Xavier worthy to to a degree. We were talking about this last night, weren't we? Anyways, I think Brett Veach is. I, I think there's a non-zero tra- chance that Brett Veach is aggressive for a guy he has as a blue chip player on his board. Brock Bowers is a blue chip player. I don't know if the Chiefs would do this, but if they just are enamored with the Brock Bowers and want to play in livid twelve personnel and have two guys that can flex out and move around and are difficult to bring down and are dynamic at the tight end position, like whew, Brock Bowers would be awesome, and the Chiefs could use their all three of their first picks to move up to pick 16. It's Wait, not. It's Steven J just gave us a super chat here on hinge. Yeah. Is there a universe in which Brock Bauer slides to like 12 and we jump up and gets him? I, I mean, I, I have the draft math for you if you'd like, because yeah. I definitely started doing this earlier. That's too far. I just want to say real quick before you do that. I, I don't know the, I don't even need to hear the compensation. That's too big of a jump for a tight end. That is historically small, short and light. I just, that's too far of a jump for a very risky proposition on tight end. If it's a like pick 24 for some crazy reason, let's have the conversation, but going up that far and Ken's about to tell you what it's going to cost. That's too much for, for Brock Bowers. Okay, go ahead. Treat him like a big slot and get over it, Matthew. Okay. Uh, don't, okay, don't trade up for a big slot. Like, <laughs> I, I think, I think Patrick Mahomes and Brock Bowers would be terrifying. Very slow slot wide receiver too. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the Chiefs could get like 32, 64, 95 could get them to that 15, 16 range. Gotcha. So it doesn't take a catastrophic f- fall for them, but it is definitely a sell the farm type scenario. I think every tight end outside of that's available to them at 32 if they were to, to choose. And honestly, I don't think anybody out of maybe Jatavian Sanders would be worth it. And even then, I don't think I'd feel great about Jatavian Sanders being the pick. I, I think I'd get over it. But, um, outside of him, I don't think there's anybody even in contention at pick 32. So we oh, can kind I, of, Oh, I don't even know if there's, I think J Jatavion Sanders is the only tight end in contention at 64. And even then, like, am I okay with the pick then? Yes. But there's been a couple, you know, rumors, things kind of there. Like maybe he wasn't the most motivated player at Texas. Maybe he didn't always wasn't the most team player type tight end at Texas. And like you combine that with a guy that didn't test as athletic as a lot of people were going to think he was like, he's a smooth mover still. 
Like I think Sanders is a very smooth mover, but he's not quite as athletic as you want. His blocking does leave a little bit to be desired and effort, especially if you go back two years. And just like I said, you start hearing, you know, just from people that have been around the program saying like, hey, maybe he wasn't the most team friendly. Not that he's a bad person, just wasn't the most team friendly player on that roster. Like I would even have a cup, a little bit of hesitation, I think, about taking him at 64. Again, I would move on. I would get over it because I do I don't think that Titans that move as fluidly as he do, does come around that often. It's just, I don't think that's like a slam dunk home run pick that he's not available at 64. And he's not a good blocker. Like he, he's really not a good blocker. So <laughs> if you're, if you're in 12 personnel with Jatavian Sanders and Travis Kelsey is out there at this point in Travis Kelsey's career, not trying to have a George Kittle thing I, it, at this point in his career, hey, his George. willingness to blonk is much less than it was earlier. Now you got two guys on the field that don't really want to block. You're not going to force teams into base. You're not going to force them into the advantageous looks that you would typically get with a 12 personnel lineup. So I I know that everybody is looking for the next Kelsey replacement. And I know I've said this before, but we need to get over that. Like it ain't happening. Travis Kelsey is one of one. You better be ready to cope with some deficiencies there. And I know that everybody looks at this offense and just says, oh, you know, they need a stud tight end to work. They don't. They really don't. They would make up for it with good wide receivers and everything like that. And that leads everybody mocking them tight ends early, not saying they won't take a tight end in this draft, but guys, they just came off a historic tight end class. Like we gushed about how awesome the tight end class was last year. The Chiefs took one look at it and went, now we're good. We're absolutely good on this. We feel good about where we are with our lineup. So they don't, they prioritize it, but not in the way that I think all of us expect them to with Travis Kelsey on the back end of his career here. So I'm not looking at tight end, even at 64 at this point in this class. I don't think the value's there. I don't think it makes a ton of sense. So I'm moving on to try and find a guy that's a depth piece to block a little bit. The, coexist with Travis a little bit more in round three, four, five, six. I believe I saw a report that the Chiefs are kind of dipping their toe in a in a range of a of a day three tight end. I think Eric All I saw reported as getting a, a 30 visit with the Chiefs, if I remember correctly. So maybe they are looking at, you know, a, a lower tier of tight end. You know Ben Sinnott would be a phone. Kate Stover, Theo Johnson, those type of players could be available mm-hmm. to them at pick 94. Um I wouldn't be surprised by any of those guys at all. The day, the day four, the day three kind of targets, like there's, there's going to be a lot of those guys as well. And again, like you can go back and listen to some of our more detailed breakdowns of some of these players as well on the KCSN draft show. Like we've kind of gone in depth on some of these guys. So, but like just looking at the names of players that could be available in these tiers, I think a lot will be available to them still, even at 90, at 95. Correct. I mean, I'm, I'm looking, yeah, so Nick, going through those guys, like the Stovers, Theo Johnson, Ben Sinnott, Shaheem Bell, like, I'm not sold that any one of those guys has separated themselves from the rest, and so I don't know if I would want to be the team that's having to, like, make that decision at 95 and not just see what's available in round four or on day three. I I, to Craig's point, I don't think any of these guys are even close to like replacing a Travis Kelsey level player. Like they're not, I don't think any of them are that type of prospect. I think they are all a little bit more like role type tight ends that are going to fill a specific role. And that's plenty good to work with a Noah Gray or somebody like that for the future until you maybe get a chance to get another true top end tight end one. I don't think any of these guys are that. So I'm not going to overdraft one. I would rather just wait until day three and take a tip Ryman. And Eric Alt, a guy that I know can come in and fulfill a very single specific role to go along with Travis Kelsey and Noah Gray Gray. and maybe Irv Smith going forward for a year or two. And then whenever Kelsey calls it quits, then we can start working harder. But like this just isn't the class to me to try to force a tight end one. So like I I think taking a tight end in the first two days of this draft would be like the one of the years where I'd be like, hmm, hard pass for me. I think in years almost every year I'm like, I like some of the tight ends here. There's good value. This is the first year in a while that I've been like, I don't know if I really see the value at this position here. It's a lot of role players to me. Yeah. Tip Ryman and Jared Wiley in round four over Sonat. Theo Johnson, Cade Stover, any of those guys at 95. Senate. It's a slam like dunk Sinat. for me. Yeah, we know you do. This is like a DiCaprio uh, Boodle versus Bootlay situation. Like, there's a lot more success if it was Bootlay. 
I let that one I let that one slide for so long. It took me like several episodes. I was finally like, okay, it let Craig, it's boodle. I hate to tell you. Nope. But bootleg. it's boodle. <laughs> That's why it went the way it did. Should have went with my bootleg. All right, we're giving a boodle to the tight ends and moving on to the tackles then. A bootleg. Uh I think really strong tackle class again. You know, yeah. I I feel like a lot of the tackles that would excite me at 32 are probably off the board by 32. And then I think there is a small gap between like the players that seem pretty likely to be first round picks and then guys that could go anywhere between 32 and 45 ish. You know, I, I look at Joe Alt, Olufashanu, Troy Fatanu, Amarius Mims, Talise Fuaga. I think Tyler Guyton all are players that I believe will be gone by JC pick Latham. 32 JC and Latham then jc well. latham i believe will too but oh i just it seems like there's really? a little bit less there seems like to be a little bit less less around him lately and they i don't he had their pro day today and i didn't see like if, about anything specific i know he worked out and stuff just people seem to be once again impressed by his physical makeup how he's put together and like it's a tackle. So like you kind of expect that, but like, you know, him and Amarius Mims, I think kind of stand out from the way they're built. Um, mm -hmm. I feel, I would feel more confident saying Latham is definitely off the board than Guyton or Mims. Mims has like six games that you're basing your entire draft strategy off of. Now yeah. I love him. I think he's a phenomenal player, but guess what? He also got hurt just trying to work out in shorts and a t-shirt. So like, I, I think Latham is a guy that we can chalk up the comfortably off the board. Mims, Guyton. I don't know what the NFL is trying to do with this Olu thing. Um, I don't know if it's just <laughs> rando, you know, hearsay because people are bored of talking about him. But if that man starts falling into that 20 range, like some mock drafts from national media people have had lately, that's a guy I think you consider trading up for. I don't know if I would, could recommend trading up for any of the other tackles that we've mentioned so far, right? Like, I think it's him falling. You consider trading up for, but yeah, I, all Fashanu, Fuaga, Latham, Fatanu, Mims, Guyton. Maybe all off the board, but I think Mims or Guyton are your best chance to fall to 32 of that group. And Mims is my guy in this scenario in a trade up. Like I, I would be ecstatic with that, knowing for what like you would hear you would see me doing backflips and simultaneously talking about how this man has barely played any football at the collegiate level. Like I understand the huge risk that comes with it. Yeah. But again, he's got the highest ceiling, arguably, of any but any of those guys that we mentioned there guys his size don't move like that guys his size don't play football like that like it, it is rare and i know there's not a whole lot of tape and all of that but that would be like the only guy there i see a lot of jordan morgan you know to the chiefs there that that one you know at, at pick 32 i i don't see that i just i i don't think that that one really fits for the kansas city chiefs there and then you know kingsley help me out here kent with the last Suma name Thank you, buddy. So Mateo. Mateo. Yeah. Mateo. Um, or Mateo, Mateo. If you guys want to get into that. But, uh, Mateo Mateo. Sense. He's, he's <laughs> at least got the size. He's at least got the length. Like it, he makes a little more sense for me, you know, in Kansas city there. I just know that we've seen a lot of Jordan Morgan, you know, maybe before the draft I, I, or not before the draft, before the combine, I saw a lot of that before he got measurements and all of that. Yeah. I, I just don't think that he's, quite the same to touch on him city. under 33 inch arms for jordan morgan I, I struggle he's, to see the andes seeing he's a him guard as a tackle. yeah he's a guard in the kcsn draft guide and yeah. some, so some you, nfl teams might pl try him at tackle they might but like we've seen better tackles get drafted and immediately move to guard for having the same or even better arm length i i think specifically for the chiefs i don't even know if it's worth I would be incredibly shocked if they played him at tackle. So he's a guard. So like, that's why he wasn't mentioned in this at all. So like, yeah, I, I how do you guys feel about the tackles? Like, okay, let's say it's Guyton. Cause he's the lowest in the consensus board or okay. Kingsley or your two guys left at 32. How, how happy would you be with those two picks? Either one of those picks at 32. I would absolutely love Tyler Guyton. I love, I think he's a dancing bear. I think he's got immense upside. I might go draft. I might go sign Donovan Smith afterwards and give Tyler Guyton a, a red shirt year to help him kind of get yeah. ready to roll. But Tyler Guyton is a, he's got the you know athleticism and, and the, the stature to be an exceptional left tackle. And, you know, I think he has the kind of blue chip upside that I like personally. So I'd be thrilled. Kingsley, I think is a fine pick. Like, I will 100% understand it. 
He's got the five star pedigree. It's not the tape is bad. It's just I think he's just a little he's a he's a notch below some of these other players. So like, yeah, I, I I'd be fine with all those of, of Amarius Mims. If the Chiefs pull the trigger on Amarius Mims and they're comfortable with the medicals, that's might be my favorite first round pick that they could possibly have realistically. But I don't even think it's really that realistic, honestly. No, still, I don't believe it. But yeah, I'm I'm all in on I'm 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 all good with Tyler Guyton if that's the pick. And I'm I'm with Kit though. I, I don't think that you're turning around and you're going tackles fixed. Um, even and That's, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't like, know that I. It's fixed in 25, 26, and 27. It is. It mm-hmm. is. But I mean, I'm looking at this. They got Wanye Morris, who you can convert to a swing tackle. Not saying that that's a wasted third round pick. That's or a guard. Still a good third round pick or guard or you know you figure out a way to make Wanye Morris work. I'm I'm not worried about this from a Wanye Morris perspective, but. Now you've got a third round pick from last year and a first round pick from this year that you're essentially saying, okay, you're riding the pine this year. And then, you know, you just got done with a first round pick this past year that you basically said you're riding the pine. If we're going to go into the draft every year with the expectation that they are going to take these high ceiling guys and try and get the most out of them, which again, with Andy Heck and Joe Cullen is not a bad strategy. I'm not saying that's a bad strategy, then I, I think the free agency attack needs to be a lot different than it has been. You need to start trying to find starter level players in free agency a lot more aggressively than the Chiefs had focused on that recently. You know, it, yes, there's there's going to be a Donovan Smith kicking around after the draft, and you can sign that guy. He will be fine as a stopgap. They just got done winning the Super Bowl. I can hear all of you in my ears right now. Yes, I totally agree with that, but. This is a completely different strategy than we've seen Brett Veach take outside of King Felix last year. I think. So I think. The, oh, okay. No. No. You go good. Ahead. Okay. I was just gonna say. I think I I side a little bit more with Kingsley than Guyton. Um. I think he's a little bit more fixable. I think Guyton's got some significant technical flaws, which leads me to. And this is with both those guys. I'm a little with Craig, and you're drafting them at the end of round one just to go into it knowing you're gonna have to redshirt them again, though. After just doing it last year, I get it. I get the process. I get trying to throw resources at a position that you don't have a surefire fix for. So I'm not upset if with either one of those guys at 32 and high positional I value. Yeah, I just don't know if it's my I preferred. It. I just don't know if it's my preferred path to continuously go after high ceiling guys, especially these two, both of which I think have pretty low floors too. Like I don't think either one of them have a safe floor of oh, this guy's definitely at least going to be able to play as a functional tackle if he doesn't make significant improvements to his technique, his timing, the way he reads out stuff. So like I just, I think there's a pretty big learning gap there, and they just took a guy like that last year in Wanya Morris. So like. That's a, that's why it's probably not my preferred route, but I would get it um, for either one of those two guys. Like I'm a little higher on Kingsley than I think a lot of people are for that same stuff. And so this takes into the, the next part of this, the round two, great round one we're talking about here. Like we're talking about all these guys in round one, but in round two, like stop me. Like when I say a name that like really excites you as a round two offensive tackle, right? Patrick Paul. Stop. Okay. <laughs> that's that's the that's the only player on the on the <laughs> consensus board and the top 64 picks that we haven't talked about right yeah. you have kyron you know, and this is a name <laughs> kieran amagaji yeah that kieran guy Amagaji. From Yale. who is the, and by the way that is one of the most andy reed tackles ever because he's got freakishly long arms yeah. so just he does, think but about it's, yeah, it's the same thing. It's just a huge developmental curve, like maybe even yes. bigger than the other guys, right? And so now that's why you're looking at him in round two, but it's just it's another very long developmental offensive tackle. Mm-hmm. Blake Fisher out of Notre Dame, like that's probably it. That's probably the yes. last of your day two tackles. So do either of those guys excite you? N- not in the, no. not not a ton. And I could, I'd understand Kieran Amagaji if they did it. And it's similar to what they're trying to do in round one. It's just a probably a bigger learning curve with more question marks because of the you know level of play. Kieran Amagaji didn't even really perform in any of the the Senior Bowls or anything, the like the Shrine Bowls or anything like He's that, because he was injured. So there is there's even more projection there. I just and that I think that's where things get interesting because we just got done talking about receivers we feel comfortable with at 45, 55, 64. And we just listed a bunch of tackles that we don't feel comfortable with. Mm -mm. And if you, if you look at it from that perspective and they really are hell bent on taking a tackle, the tackles got to get drafted in the first round. 
Like I, like that, I really think that. And if you want him to start, a big difference, if you though, want him to be a future left tackle starter for you, yes. And that's yeah. And after that, you're looking at backups. You're looking at rotational players. You're looking at potential swing tackles. Like I think that I think the well dries up quicker at tackle, and I think it. You know, I nothing will surprise me at tackle if they want to try to. Look, I one thing I want to have a conversation about with you guys at some point is the 2025 roster because we don't do enough talking about the 2025 roster when we are looking at this year's draft. We every year there is one pick that is always kind of slanted towards the next season. And if you know you are one, the, the Chiefs are going to have some big offensive line decisions that are going to be coming up in 2025. They still, you know, maybe if Wanya Morris works out, they have a tackle, but. All that to say, you probably have to do it in round one if you're going to do it because of what we just kind of went through here with this exercise. You want to move on to interior offensive line or is there any just, you know, day three tackle that you really want to talk about? I mean, not even day three, but I think there's, if if you miss out, so we talked about, I think the guys at the end of round one and in round two, or that you would be available in round two are definitely long-term developmental guys that need a year or two. And like, that's why I get a little, a little hesitant to lock in tackle to the chiefs in either one of those spots. Cause they're just such long, so long developmental plans for a team that currently doesn't have a left tackle. So mm-hmm. like, I, you know, I, that's why I'd almost rather, you know, go the vet signing. And if that's the case and you're just going to be drafting a developmental guy anyway, does it need to be round one? Does it need to be round two? Or can I go get a Roger Rosengarten in round three? Can I get a Javon Foster in the middle rounds of this draft? Are there other people that Christian Jones out of text? Like, are there guys that I can just pull in from the middle rounds? Now I have Wanya Morris and I have this other mid round tackle. If I have to go get a veteran to play over them anyway, does it have to be a round one pick? Or can I yeah. just get a couple mid round developmental guys and see what shakes out? That's kind of the, the decisions that I think they have to look at because Again, we talked about Guyton, Patrick, Paul, Kingsley. These guys aren't probably playing day one this year anyway. You probably still have to pay a vet. Maybe I can use that draft pick on a player that's going to have an earlier impact, a safer floor, since I have to go pay a vet tackle anyway. I And I know that we've talked about these guys in the Shrine, and we'll move on to interior offensive line after this, but Julian Pearl uh, from Illinois and Walter Rouse from Oklahoma really liked what I've seen out of both of those guys and probably guys that you would have had to take in round three in other classes because they're – you know, this is such a stacked class. You might be able to get him in the middle of day three now. So if you're looking for a developmental guy that's going to come in there, get a few spot reps and be able to hold his own well enough, I think that those guys are perfectly capable of coming in and doing that. I like those guys on the roster. I I do think, though, yeah, I'm, I'm with you guys. You miss out on them in round one. Just wait. Just wait at this point. I think that's I want to shout of- out Wyoder. For the Anim Dankwa shout, it's not not a name that you hear many people talk about. Seeing him yeah. in person, he is oh one of the most gosh. massive players that you're ever going to see. And he needs a ton of work, but that's the thing though. Coming, you know, he, he's going to come in. You're going to have the ability to give him all the work. He doesn't like he doesn't know what he doesn't know. You're going to start from a completely clean slate with him. So yeah, it's a long term developmental track. But man, you give me a six foot seven, thirty six inch armed guy that weighs two hundred fifty pounds and can move the way he does. Hey, let's have fun. I mean, we're see, excited see, that see. they have Chu Godrick on the roster right now. Dankwa, do, do the same thing. Do yeah. He's played more football than Chu has, you know, so yeah, go go do that. I'm fine with that. They And I believe they brought Chu Godrick back, so they, they saw something yeah. in him that they like, by the way. So that was a that was a positive, encouraging sign for him. But, yeah, I mean, Anim Dankwa, man, and he like, he seemed to take to coaching well when he was there. Um got some positive reviews from some from some people uh there as well. So I yeah man, I wouldn't be surprised to see him I don't I, if he got drafted earlier than round 7, I wouldn't be stunned like at all. I I think he could go earlier than some people think because he is an intriguing player. Interior offensive line time, let's get out of let's get out of here with this. I think there's there's a chance a couple interior players are are gone off the board uh before the Chiefs are picking. I think most likely you're rooting for interior offensive linemen to go off the board in round one to help push one of these players. I think Jackson powers Johnson has a chance to go. I I'm Jordan Morgan, Graham Barton. I think those three names uh, are three players that I definitely think could see their names called in round one and kind of help push some players at 32 down to the chiefs. 
Um, and there seems to be some teams that could bite on the interior offensive line too that might want to center like the Pittsburgh Steelers are one of those teams you kind of pay attention to as someone that might just take the best interior offensive line. Like I think the 20s is where it could start. You could see the Niners taking a Graham Bart. I, I, when I do mock drafts, I throw Graham Bart into the Niners all the time. Like it's just one of the ones like <laughs> it makes sense. I, it makes I default sense. <laughs> to. I uh, yeah. So I I think there's a chance that you get three interior offensive line off the board in the first round. I, I hope there's three. I think that'd be big. I think mm-hmm. that'd be really big. I I feel more comfortable saying again if I set this line at one and a half, and for round one here, I I feel really good that Jackson Powers Johnson goes in round one. Graham Barton, shh, I think will. But I, I don't think it's a lock to go just because there is going to be some other guys that fill the role. And like the wild card, too. We haven't mentioned it. Zach Frazier out of West, West Virginia. He's a center only. That's the problem. Yeah. However, mm-hmm. I think he's a, the best center in this class. I think he's be- if he's so much farther along than Jackson Powers Johnson, he's just very limited on where you can play him. So like that, a team would have to fall in love with him as a center. And center only center only players don't usually get drafted that high. So I don't think mm-hmm. it's likely, but he's at least in that mix with the Jordan Morgans and the Graham Barton to maybe sneak in at the end of round one. I think if you roll it over to round two, though, I don't think you're adding that many more players that are definitely off the board in round two. It's really mm-hmm. those same four names that we named. And like, yeah, there's guys like Christian Haynes, I thought has come on really strong since the senior bowl from UConn at the end of the season. I actually really, really like him. Um, Dominic Pooney out of Kansas. It, round two might be a little rich for me, but you know, some people really like him. He's going to be moving inside most likely from tackle. So him in round two, I I don't know if that's where I would love to take him if I was an NFL team, but you might have to, especially if you're the Chiefs at 64. If you want Pooney, you probably would have to take him there. And maybe he gives you an emergency tackle that you plan on transitioning inside to an interior offensive line position. So I don't think that many more come off the board before 64. It's just, do you even want to consider taking one that early either? No, no, I don't. I I am just not in the position where I want to address this position until round three, probably the earliest. I think there's a good group of guys that are still hanging out in round three. And especially since you've got your interior offensive line. I know we all see Trey Smith is probably gone next year. This is one that you take a swing on a guy and you just say, hey, listen, hang out for another year. You get to play with Patrick Mahomes next year. And if somebody gets not dinged up, hey, guess what? You're going to get to play, you know, for Patrick Mahomes this year. Joe Tooney might not be on this roster next year, you know. So they might be looking for a couple of guards. Taking a swing on a guy in round three, that's a position that you feel pretty good about becoming a starter fairly rapidly, maybe sit for a year, and you feel good about a Christian Mahogany or a Mason McCormick, you know, coming in and being able to, I, I don't know that either one of those guys is going to be available, but, you know, I, they they just keep rising up the ranks here. I would feel really good about having those guys in my back pocket for this year. I have seen a little bit here. I did want to address this really quick because I've seen it, a little bit and we are talking about interior offensive linemen not trying to pick on joey here but he said what about the chiefs drafting a center and moving creed to guard i don't think that there's any chance of that happening i know everybody saw the snaps this year and i totally get why they're thinking that um he obviously changed his snapping style you know he he's melon snapping now so you know it took him a little while to get into that had a not great Super Bowl snapping and a not great most of the year snapping. After the ball is snapped, he was a top one center in the league at everything else. Don't move him. Don't move him around. Don't do any of that. Jason Kelsey is gone now. He is the best center in the league, bar none. That's where he exists. That's where he thrives. Another offseason of melon snapping is going to be just fine. So I... They're going to sign Creed Humphrey to a long-term deal. I fully believe that. And he's going to stay at center with Patrick Mahomes because they believe in him that much and what he does before and after the snap. So I know a lot of people have been trying to slot in centers in mock drafts here. I don't think that there's a real strong chance. Maybe a guy with some flexibility that can kick inside as a backup guy, but not somebody that you're going to try and take to start. And, just because a player can play center doesn't mean he's going to be a good in, a good guard either. And I'm not saying that Creed Humphrey is going could or couldn't be a good guard, but also watched him play a little bit of guard in that week 18 game and like that's not a fair evaluation, but it definitely didn't look quite the same, you know. Uh he might be, be like some players are just simply better with the ball in their hand 
they are able to use more initial quickness because they're the ones kind of anticipating the snap at the best level. It helps them create better body positioning for some of the blocks, pass sets that they want to accomplish. Sometimes having the ball in their hand matters when you're looking at a player too. So just taking it out of his hand could actually make him not as good of a football player, believe it or not, too. Uh, I don't, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not in on moving Creed. I don't think it makes sense at all. Uh, it doesn't seem very logical to do that. So I, I, I think you've got to, you got to roll with that. Try to find some guard help. <clears throat> One of Creed and Trey probably gets signed. I'd be my guess uh, in 2024. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there. Any other interior offensive line before we get out of here, Matthew? Yeah, I mean, I'll wrap it up. I just wanted to like put the bow on this too. Is like to if you're going to bring in a center to play over Creed, you're probably drafting a center only player, and that doesn't sound like a Chiefs move to get an offense interior an offensive lineman that can only play one position is very anti them, right? So like, what I think I would be hard for me to see them saying like, oh, we're trying to put our best five out there. We drafted this interior offensive lineman, but he's only one of our best five if he plays center, which means Creed has to move. Like it just, it seems like they're going to value versus they value versatility over like a specialized skill set. And to the point, this is one year of bad snapping from Creed Humphrey trying out a new snap type. Maybe he goes back. Maybe he gets better out of it with a whole nother year to practice it, like off season to practice it. Right. So like we're at minimum 365 days away from panicking over Creed Humphrey's ability to snap a football while playing center. Um, I wanted to go back to Craig's point. I don't think that Chiefs should be looking too hard interior offensive linemen in the first two days, unless someone falls to that 95 pick. There's a handful of guys that are in those middle rounds. Mission Mahogany, Zach Zinter, he got injured for Michigan late in the stretch, but he's a phenomenal football player there on the interior. Bo Limmer out of Arkansas position flexibility across the middle. Like there is so many interior offensive linemen that rushing to pick one before pick 90 or before, you know, day three of the draft in the chief's position where it's a future pick pick and you're probably not choosing the cream of the crop guys at this point anyway like you're choosing somebody that's going to need a little bit more time or is a little bit more specialized it seems like a, an overreach to plan for the future when you may or may not even have trey smith you don't know the answer to that yet all right it's time to get out of here thank you all so much for listening to the show thank you all so much for supporting kc sports network we really appreciate you that is it for this episode of the KC Laboratory, though. We will be back on Monday. Only Weird Games is tomorrow. We've got all kinds of great stuff going on right now. Benny Heiss, I believe, live streaming here very shortly. Haley Lewis has got a new series at 10 minutes every day on KC Sports Network as well. Thank you all so much. We'll catch you later. Love you. Bye, Draft Guy.